from one date to another and from one age to another. So we looked at the survival, uh, survivorship function as well, but also we defined death being a permanent disappearance of all evidence of life at any time after a live birth has taken place. And we were able to again look at uh, death density function. Uh, we looked at the hazard function and uh, uh, other terms included follow-up time, time origin, uh, minimum age criteria, recording entry time, and then we looked at censoring as well. And uh, we said this is uh, uh, an event that occurs unknowingly uh, before the event that uh, was bound to occur. And we, we were able to depict this using uh, an individual who is on a study for a diabetic drug dying as a result of uh, accident before uh, the projected period of death. Then we looked at some of the competing risks that may be there uh, in terms of uh, the probability of observing the event of interest uh, and another event occurring uh, at that same uh, observation period. And we looked at the survival curve in, 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 in its uh, illustration. And here, uh, we could be able to see how we were projecting the lifespan uh, or the probability or the number of people who can survive to a certain number of years if they are heavy smokers, moderate smokers, and non-users of, uh, of any cigarette. And uh, we were able to determine uh, what we call the median uh, survival curve, meaning the, media, the middle point in which uh, a number of people will survive when they are heavy smokers or moderate smokers or non-users. Then uh, we also looked at, uh, furthermore, we were able to explain what a hazard ratio is, the mean survival time, and the five-year survival term, uh, survival rate, sorry. And then we also explained duration time, uh, the different measures, uh, and uh, we further tried to describe censoring as well. And uh, I think we looked at some of the common functions in survival analysis, where we looked at the survival function, uh, the cumulative hazard function, and the hazard function. And uh, I think we ended up looking at the survival function. And today we shall be able to look at some of the other uh, common functions in survival analysis that include the cumulative hazard function and the hazard function. However, there was a question asked whether these are calculations that have to be done. Uh, and uh, we said that uh, uh, this is a probability measure of an event occurring. And we were able to look at uh, in, 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 in context, to try and contextualize survival function, we said that uh, in the context of our examples mentioned above, it gives uh, the probability that a randomly selected patient will survive beyond time t. So this is what survival function is about. You are trying to determine using a probability measure uh, the, the, the time period in which an event might occur from the start time. For example, we also said that an unemployed person uh, taking more than two or t, t months to find a new job. All, uh, when we're referring to t, it means we're looking at what we call a time period. And that is what we call the, 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 the survival function uh, in there. <clears throat> so uh, we explained uh, how the meanings are, and we said uh, it is equal to one, uh, at t is equals to zero, and it is zero at t is equals to infinity, <coughs> which is explained. Uh, uh, excuse me, <coughs> which is explained in this curve, where we explain that uh, survival probability runs from zero point zero to about one. So the probability. Uh, so the probability the probability that someone will survive to 400 years or 400 seconds or 400 months 
whatever way you decide to uh, to time it uh, drops as you see from the probability one. So from this explanation where we are saying t is equals to zero, we are saying that uh, this is the beginning time. So t equals to zero would mean this is the beginning time. And uh, as you can see from where my cursor is, uh, the, the, the probability of survival keeps reducing up to time infinity, where you can be able to see here uh, the number of people that will survive. So you can roughly see here that uh, from 0, 0.0, uh, it will take 400, up to about 400, when uh, there will be no person surviving or there will be no uh, person getting a job in whatever event you try to apply this survival function. So uh, the, the curve shows the proportion of individuals who, as time goes on, have not experienced an event. And someone had required that we get an example of uh, how the survival function occurs. So I decided to come up with some illustrations today, and uh, we can look at them roughly uh, before we proceed to, to look at the other uh, measures. So there are graphs that I have, I have shown here. There are graphs here. All of these are survival function graphs. You can see the survival function one, the survival function two, survival function three, and survival function four. And you can be able to see uh, the, the proportions of survival or the probability of survival uh, in, 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 the vertical, in the vertical axis. You can be able to see they run from 1.0. Uh, let me just zoom it a little so that you can, you can be able to see what I'm, I'm saying for those who, who might not be seeing. So you can be able to see that uh, we are measuring time function from zero to 10 months. And therefore, the probability of survival is from one to about zero. It is from zero to about one. And we are saying in that description that the graphs below show examples of hypothetical survival functions. Uh, we shall be able to see how some of these curves are made or they, they come up with some of these curves. But they are very long statistical measures if you're doing them manually. However, if you're using uh, statistical uh, packages such as uh, R, uh, such as uh, Stata and uh, SPSS, you may be able to generate some of these uh, uh, hypothetical uh, survival uh, curves. So we are saying that the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the proportion of subjects surviving. So the graph shows the, the probability that a subject will survive beyond time t. So for example, uh, for, for survival function one, which is this, for example, for the survival function one, we're saying that the probability of surviving longer than a time which is two months is 0 0.37. So if you looked at this graph, uh, for someone to be able to survive to two months, the probability is uh, here, where, where two meets uh, the curve will be at about 0 0.37. And that is the probability that a person can survive to time t. <coughs> and uh, that is 37% of subjects survive more than two months. So that is what uh, uh, that interpretation means. For example, if you were uh, administering a particular kind of drug, uh, you, you should be able to, to, to have uh, a survival function stating that uh, the, this number of clients or patients uh, can, can, can be able to recover after two days. So the probability of recovery after two days should be about 0 0.37, meaning that 37% of your clients will recover within two days, or 37% of them will recover beyond uh, the two days of administering uh, the particular drug that uh, you could have administered as, as a clinician. So, uh, however, to explain these survival functions further, we're looking at uh, the second survival curve. And we're saying that for, for, the, for survival function two, the probability of surviving longer than two months is actually 0 
meaning that uh, 97 percent of subjects survive more than two months so you can be able to see survival function to here that uh, uh, if you dissected from two going up to meet the curve you will be able to see that uh, uh, in two months time uh, the, 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 the level of survival is still high however by the time uh, individuals approach six months you can see that the probability of living is actually zero so it means that uh, the maximum number of months these uh, people can actually spend is roughly 4. Uh, 4. Uh, uh, 4. 8, 4. I mean 5.8 or 5.6 months around there. So these are very key functions. Like I said earlier on, uh, if you wanted to establish the likelihood that uh, you might have uh, stillbirth, you might have macerated birth, or you might have pregnancy complications among your mothers. For example, you should be able to state the number of women or pregnant mothers who have attended antenatal care. And therefore, you look at the number or the maximum number of antenatal care that they have attended. If they are 10, it would mean that the level of survival or the level of non, uh, of non complexity in pregnancy would be uh, if you're taking 10, 10 antenatal visits, then you would be able to see that for those uh, who, who, who attended uh, one antenatal care, the probability of survival keeps reducing drastically and it keeps increasing for those uh, who attend higher uh, antenatal care uh, services. So those are how, how uh, practical survival functions can work at your at your at your different uh, workplaces or at, uh, in the different fields that uh, uh, each of you subscribe to. Similarly, you can uh, apply the same principle in measuring dietary issues. How certain certain children recover if they are given R U T F or if they are given uh, F one. So, uh, having looked at a survival function, we can now further go and look at what we call the cumulative hazard function. And we are, uh, this is just a simple uh, cumulative, you know, cumulative runs uh, relatively, meaning it goes uh, over a, a period of time. So, uh, we, we, we looked at <coughs> the definition of hazard function already. However, we're going to discuss it again, but our cumulative uh, hazard function is just roughly telling you that it is the logarithm, meaning the continuous uh, uh, movement over time uh, of, of, of the subject of study. So it has the following properties, that uh, it is an increasing function, and uh, it, 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 it takes values in, in zero plus infinity. So meaning, uh, cumulative would mean uh, first month, uh, first month plus the second month to give you a cumulative addition, then the third plus the fourth, the fourth plus the fifth, the fifth plus the sixth. So that cumulative or that random uh, relative movement is what we call uh, cumulative hazard function. And I was saying that uh, the survival function T is the exponential of uh, of the hypothesis uh, of survival of T. And we're saying that the cumulative hazard is the total hazard experienced up to time T. So in the next slide, we're going to look at hazard function. However, the total hazard that is being experienced up to the time, B, uh, up to the time T, meaning the end time, is what we call a cumulative function. For example, in, 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 in practicability, you look at the number of women who attended at a dental care or the number of deliveries you had in one month, uh, say from January to, to December. Therefore, you look at uh, your cumulative deliveries in, in January, uh, cumulative, uh, I mean, you, you, you don't look at cumulative, but you look at your deliveries in January, your deliveries in February, your deliveries in March continuously, then the cumulative bit would mean that you add deliveries in January, Feb, up to December. So that total delivery that is experienced up to December, which is time T, which is the end time, 
is what we refer to as a cumulative uh, bit. So from your start of the of your start to the end is what we call the end time. And uh, here now we, we, we want to now understand what the hazard function is uh, practically here. That the hazard function or hazard rate is defined as a uh, as this, however, we we, we we defined it using words in our earlier definitions. But this is the formula that is applied, and uh, you can say that uh, it comes to uh, d uh, d over d t uh, versus the the hypothetical uh, time. However, these these uh, these particular formulas are already uh, calculated in the in, in some of the measures that you would want to use. So you may not have to go, uh, you may not have to go practical to, to type these things and, uh, and so forth. So it is important that you, imp you embrace uh, technology because some of these are programming languages that have already been uh, done. So it will just be a matter of putting figures in there and it analyzes automatically. So we may not be able to go into the deep uh, functions of, 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 of coming up with this because uh, they are automatically generated uh, if, you, if you go further and, uh, and read, uh, and read in, 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 in other statistical packages. So we are saying that the hazard function has about uh, the following properties. And one is that uh, it has a positive function so it is not necessarily increasing or decreasing. So positive function means it, it, it moves, uh, it, is, it is a moving average. So it does not decline. So it is always n plus one as a moving average. And uh, another property is that the hazard function, which we put as hazard uh, function t, uh, where h can have many different shapes and is therefore a useful tool to summarize uh, survival data. That is one of the properties about the hazard function because it can take any shape. Because uh, in, 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 in hazard ship, uh, you're looking at an event that might be experienced uh, before the prior event of study. So we are saying in the example of cancer patients, the hazard function T measures the instantaneous risk of dying right after time t, given the individual is alive at time t. So here we're saying, for example, in the first month, uh, the hazard function of t is measuring what is the risk that an individual in the first month of having cancer will actually die. So to link the hazard rate with, uh, the hazard rate with the survival function, the survival curve represents the hazard rates. A steeper slope indicates a higher hazard rate because uh, events happen more frequently, reducing the proportion of individuals who have not experienced the event at a faster rate. So you can be able to see here, the hazard function in this survival function one, you would see from here how this slope is steep. So this movement from up to down shows you the hazard function the speed at which people experience hazards and are able to uh, succumb to them at that specific period of time. So uh, on the contrary, a gradual or flatter slope indicates a lower uh, hazard rate because events occur frequently, reducing the proportion of individuals who have not experienced the event at a slower rate. So for example, if you looked at a uh, uh, the fourth curve or the, five, the fourth survival uh, function here that is right here, you can be able to see that the, the hazard rate is actually slow because uh, the, the steep is, is not, uh, I mean the, the, the slope is not very steep and uh, you can see it is, it is a little uh, slow. So therefore it means that uh, individuals who are experiencing uh, uh, who are experiencing that particular hazard, uh, the, it does not really have a, a very uh, faster uh, speed of action. So it means it is acting at a very slower rate. So you have to note that uh, in contrast to the survival function, 
which focuses on not having an event, the hazard function focuses on the event occurring. <coughs> so this is where the, dif the, the difference between survival function and the hazard function happens. So uh, the, the survival function looks at the event is not going to occur, meaning that the person survives. However, the hazard function looks at the person or the event uh, occurring in that bit. So now we want to look at the survival curves. Remember, uh, we had looked at uh, the survival function, uh, meaning that uh, we said this survival function uh, is most times uh, represented using these three functions. And we said it is survival function, cumulative hazard function, and the hazard function, which we will finish to look at. So we want to look at what we call the survival curves. And the survival curves are these, these curves that uh, we have been able to look at. However, we just want to have a description of how these are uh, the different methods or in which these survival curves are constructed. And we are saying that these survival curves can be constructed using different methods. One is what we call the Kaplan-Meier method. Two is the Cox proportional hazard method and the parametric models. And I was saying that the shape of the survival curve can provide insights into the nature and timing of the events that affect survival, such as mortality, recurrence, or recovery. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, sorry for that. So uh, we, we, we'll be able to look at uh, these three sp specific methods and be uh, able to understand how the construction happens. So for example, the Kaplan-Meier estimator is a non-parametric method for estimating and plotting the survival function, which is the probability of surviving uh, beyond uh, a given time. So uh, the Kaplan-Meier estimator is based on the observed survival times and censoring indicators. So hopefully we all now understand censoring uh, of, of the subject in study. So the kaplan may estimator can be used to compare the survival curves of different groups or treatments using statistical tests, such as what we call the long rank test or the Cox proportional hazard model. So we are saying a plot of kaplan Meyer estimator is a series of declining horizontal steps, which with a large enough sample size approach the true survival function for that population. The value of the survival function between successive distinct uh, sampled ob or observations is uh, to be constant. An important advantage of this method is that the method can take into account uh, some types of sensor data, particularly uh, right censoring, which occurs if a patient withdraws from a study, is lost to follow up, or is alive without event occurrence uh, at last follow-up. Uh, on the plot, small vertical tick marks state individual patients whose survival times have been right censored when no truncation or censoring occurs. So the kaplan meyer curve is the complement of the empirical distribution function. So what, what this means is that uh, when 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 you when you, when you are applying the kaplan meyer estimator in a, this is a practical measure or a practical method where you have to list the number of uh, uh, of people in, in in your in your study and you are supposed to accord them survival time so if you had 10 clients you should be able to understand uh, you should be able to plot their survival period how one person uh, survives from one uh, time t to the next time. So we're saying that in medical statistics, a typical application might involve 
around grouping patients into categories. So for instance, those with gene A profile and those with gene B profile. So in the graph, patients with gene B die much quicker than those with gene A. After two years, about 80% of gene A patients survive, but less than half of the patients with gene B will survive. So that is, uh, that is definitely how uh, this can apply in your medical statistics. And this is uh, <clears throat> what you will need to look at if you're to come up with uh, this Kaplan, uh, <clears throat> uh, Kaplan Mayer estimator. So to generate this Kaplan Mayer estimator, at least two pieces of data are required for each patient or each subject. So the status at last observation, meaning the event occurrence or right after censored, and the time to event or the time to censoring. If the survival functions between two or more groups are to be compared, then a third piece of data is required, the group assignment of each subject. So what happens is that uh, you should be able to have two, for example, if you're having diabetic, uh, if you're having diabetic uh, patients, then you can group them as a uh, female and male, and you would want to understand uh, how uh, the variation between uh, survival varies between these two, uh, these two gender, how whether female or male uh, die faster, or whether sex has an impact uh, on, on the time of death. Of a, of, of a diabetic uh, patient. So we are saying that uh, some, another method that you could use to construct this kaplan Mayer is what we call the long, uh, the log rank test. And uh, we're saying that the log rank test or the long rank test is a hypothesis. Uh, hypothesis means uh, uh, this is a scientific, a scientific conclusion or assumption onto something. So uh, this is a hypothesis test to compare the survival distribution of two samples. And uh, it is a non-parametric test and, and appropriate to use when the data are right skewed and censored. So technically, uh, you, you can be able to see that we, we have censoring here uh, and, it, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it appears uh, very many times. And it appears very many times. So it is very important uh, that you you can, you should be able to understand censoring as we, are, we, we, we explained yesterday because uh, then it can help you understand these statements more if you read through them. And we are saying, like we referred to yesterday, that, uh, that uh, uh, this censoring uh, it may not have it may not have a, uh, an, uh, it is non-informative, and it may not be of, uh, of use in your study. So it is widely used in clinical trials to establish the efficacy of a new treatment in comparison uh, with a control treatment when the measurement is the time of event. So, for example, such as the time from initial treatment to a heart attack. The test is sometimes called the Mantel-Cox test. The log rank test can also be viewed as a time stratified Cochrane Mantel uh, Hensel test. So these are the different names, but these names are a crew from the individuals uh, who wrote thesis on how this particular uh, method called the log rank uh, works. Uh, just to give you a brief or uh, a practical explanation of how this works, for we were saying that uh, it is widely used in clinical trials to establish the efficacy of a new treatment with a control treatment when the measurement is the time to event. So we are saying that uh, at first an individual is administered a new drug or is given uh, a, 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 a let us say. Uh, for example, a new medication for a heart attack. So what the log uh, rank test measures 
is actually the time an event occurs. For example, you're given a treatment, then the outcome, if, if, if you're a person that has, is suffering from, from a heart problem, you expected that an individual will die. So we want to understand if an individual is put under a treatment for a heart attack, immediately after receiving that treatment, after what period will the individual develop the heart attack? Or after what period will the heart attack occur? And that is what we refer to uh, as, a, as a measure of the log rank. Log meaning uh, it is a rank over time. So the log rank test uh, statistics compares estimates of the hazards function of the two groups at each observed time. So because you're looking at two groups, for example, I said you can disaggregate them as female, male, or you can disaggregate them by other, uh, uh, other subjects such as age, or you can uh, continue to uh, say possibly according to, to economic status and so forth and so forth. So you, you, you'll be comparing the hazard function between uh, male and female. And that is what uh, uh, this statement is meaning in there. So it is constructed by computing the observed and expected number of events in one of the groups at each observed time, and then adding this to obtain an overall summary across all time points where there is an event. So the log rank test is a statistical test used to compare survival curves between groups. It helps us determine whether there is a significant difference in event occurrence among various groups. So it helps us to understand whether male or female die faster, or whether poor or rich die faster, or whether urban or rural experience an event faster. So in your study of reproductive health, it could help you compare whether women of, or, 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 or who are bearing uh, children at an early age have a risk more than women who are bearing, uh, who are bearing, who are bearing uh, uh, children at a, at, a, at, a, at a later age, or those who are bearing children in the middle, in the middle age group there. So that is what the log uh, rank test wants to look at. And widely, it is used when we have categorical predictors, such as treatment groups or demographic characteristics, as I've mentioned. And the demographic characteristics uh, include age, uh, marital status, uh, uh, someone's uh, sex, and so forth, uh, age, and so on. So uh, the other model is what we call the Cox Proportional Hazard Method. And uh, it is a model, uh, it's in the class of survival models in statistics. And survival models relate the time that passes before some event occurs. So we are all looking at the time an event occurs in all these uh, statistical functions that we are looking at. That from the time uh, an individual starts to wear a mask, what is, the, uh, what is the period of time in which the person gets an infection? From the time a person washes his hands, what is the period of time the person takes uh, to develop a particular illness? From the, it is just like uh, determining uh, the, 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 the period of time after a mosquito bite, uh, the person gets uh, infected with mosquito uh, with, with malaria. The, that period of what we call the incubation period and so forth of 14 days. So this is roughly what we're looking at from the time period to when an event occurs. So uh, in a proportional hazard model, the unique effect of a unit increase in a covariate and uh, is, multi is multiplicative with respect to the hazard rate. For example, taking a drug may have one's hazard rate for a stroke occurring, or changing the material from which a manufactured component is constructed may double its hazard rate for failure. So here we're saying that uh, if someone or as if an individual was suffering from uh, a stroke or, uh, or a certain disease, 
and it is expected that this person will get a stroke later on. For example, this person is diabetic, so it is expected that this person will definitely uh, develop a stroke later on. What are this Cox proportional hazard model will measure is if a drug was administered to this person, what is the time it will take uh, for this person to get stroke? Will it increase this person's time period without getting stroke or it will rather reduce? So there are other types of survival models such as accelerated failure type models to do not exhibit proportional hazards. The accelerated failure time model describes a situation uh, where biological or mechanical life history of an event is accelerated. However, we are not focusing on those. Uh, we are just giving a brief. In your adequate time, you can go and actually read more about these uh, different survival modules. Uh, but we are focusing proportionally uh, on a proportional hazard uh, model of Cox. So the Cox uh, PHM is a versatile tool for survival analysis because it assesses the effects of covariates. For example, it can look at demographic factors, treatment regimens on survival, and so forth and so on. And uh, it allows us to understand how different variables impact the hazard of experiencing the event over time. A key advantage is it is applicable uh, to both categorical and uh, what we call predictor variables. So, uh, just uh, giving you a brief uh, history of what the Cox proportional hazard uh, model is. That, uh, that Sir David Cox observed that if the proportional hazards assumption holds, uh, then it is possible to estimate the effect parameters that are uh, uh, below without any consideration of the full hazard function. This approach to survival data is called application of the Cox proportional hazards method and uh, sometimes abbreviated to be Cox model uh, or, or proportional hazard model. However, Cox also noted that biological interpretation of the proportional hazards assumption can quickly be tricky. So, in other words, uh, uh, we're saying that uh, David Cox, uh, because Cox pro pro proportional hazard has the word hazard, and we looked earlier on at the hazards function. So this is typically trying to understand the hazards function. So he's trying to look at the possibility of trying to, uh, 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 of trying to, to, to reduce uh, an event occurring or a hazard uh, occurring. And that is why uh, when, we are, when we're looking at it, we're saying it can assess the effect of covariates. So meaning that uh, it can be able to assess proportionally the differences between different uh, demographic groups. So you should be able to assess uh, the hazard levels between people who are of a younger age, middle age, and uh, upper age. Or you should be able to assess the hazard levels of individuals who are attending one antenatal care, four antenatal visits, or eight antenatal visits. Or furthermore, you should be able to differentiate uh, or be able to compare the hazard function between individuals who are living in the urban settings and those who are living in the rural settings. Or you can use marital status and look at those who are separated, those who are never married, and those who are married, and those uh, who uh, might be divorced in like that. <clears throat> so some of the assumptions and diagnostics of this Cox model include that uh, it is crucial to evaluate uh, the assumptions and diagonize uh, the Cox proportional hazard model. The assumptions include proportional hazards, uh, linearity in continuous covariates, and independence of censoring. So the assumption of proportional hazards means that in that particular group of individuals, for example, if we wanted to look at it at a, at a societal level, we, we can look at the issue of race or ethnicity, uh, possibly between blacks or a particular tribe, uh, whether people of black origin or people of white origin, uh, or Negroes and so forth. If we looked at tribal 
uh, at a tribal sentiment, uh, the, 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 this measure uh, believes that in its assumption that the, pro the hazards are proportional in that particular uh, group of study. So if you're looking at only women of reproductive health, the assumption is that the hazard that these women experience is proportional between uh, all of them. Similarly, those who live in the rural areas could be having the same proportional hazards uh, that they are facing. And that is what the assumption in there means. So the diagnostic, the diagnostic tests and tools are used to check uh, these assumptions, ensuring the models validity and, uh, and reliability. So these diagnostic, these diagnostic tests are used to, to ensure that this module is valid and that it is reliable. So the, the Cox model can be extended to account for time varying covariates, but also time, cover, time varying covariates allow us to capture change in a covariant effect over time. Uh, making our analysis more dynamic and accurate. And additionally, uh, interactions between covariates can be incorporated to examine how their combined effects influence survival uh, rate. So in, in these covariates, we're looking at, uh, uh, at, at, at variables that have, uh, uh, have similar uh, 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 distributions or connectivity between themselves. So in, 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 co in, in co-variables, if you use the co-variables, uh, for example, uh, we say that uh, the possibility of, of a diabetic patient having, having uh, high blood pressure. So that means that uh, high blood pressure and diabetics are, are co-variables in, in the health system. So it additionally helps us uh, to capture the changes in covariate effects. And then we can be able to further analyze uh, how these two different illnesses uh, uh, continue to infringe uh, an individual's uh, level of survival. And then another uh, method we want to just understand in a, in, in a brief is what we call parametric survival model. And uh, we, we, here we making a conclusion that the parametric survival model assumes specific probability distributions uh, for survival times. And uh, we're saying three common distributions are exponential. We talk about the weigh bull and the long normal distribution. However, we can look at these ones later on. But for now, we, may, we, we shall not be going into the exponential uh, bit of, of, of this distribution. So we shall only be looking at uh, uh, the, the non-parametric that we have looked at. But uh, if you, we, we can be able to get time, we can look at parametric survival methods later on. So uh, the, the, these modules can provide insight into the shape of the survival curve and may fit the data better than the distributional assumptions are met. So we have some conclusions here, and this is our take home. And this is uh, what I want us to uh, to, to summarize with uh, in today's lecture. We want to summarize whatever thing that we've looked at in a few terms here. First, we are saying that survival analysis is used in several ways. One is to describe the survival times of members of the group. So, <clears throat> the functions that can be used to describe the survival times of members of a group, of a group, meaning age group, if we are saying age group, meaning the age is zero to four possibly, or one to four, or uh, a group of married people, or a group of unmarried, or a group of uh, diabetic patients. So here you can be able to see, we're looking at members in a single group. And we're saying these are some of the methods that should be used. One is a life table, Two is the kaplan meyers curve, three is the survival function, and four is the hazard function. These are the functions that are help in calculating the survival times of, a me of members of a group. However, for us to compare the survival times of two or more groups, we use what we call the long rank, the log rank test, which we describe. 
which we discussed. Thirdly, to describe the effect of categorical or quantitative variables on survival, we look at what we call the Cox proportional hazard re regression, which we have looked at. Uh, we look at the parametric uh, survival model. We look at the survival trees and the survival random forests. Those two which we have not covered, but if, if for now, uh, this, uh, this Cox proportional hazard uh, gives you a, a, very, a very important uh, grip on how you can describe the effect of a categorical variable as we were able to look at uh, there. So, so uh, in conclusion, the following terms are commonly used in survival analysis. Event, and in an event, we are looking at death, disease occurrence, disease recurrence, recovery, or other experience of interest. For example, uh, deliveries, antenatal care, uh, we, we can be looking at immunization, vaccinations, and so forth. So all those are what we call events. And they are very key terms that we use uh, in survival analysis. Then another key term, like I, I just want to repeat and help us uh, remind ourselves is time. That the time from the beginning of an observation period, such as a surgery or beginning of treatment, to an event or the end of the study, or loss of contact, or withdrawal from the study, which we call as censoring. And here we are again defining censoring. And we're saying that a censored observation occurs when we have some information about individual survival time, but we do not know the survival time exactly. The subject is censored in the sense that nothing is observed or known about the subject after the time of after the time of censoring and uh, a censor and a censored subject may or may not have an event after the end of the observation so uh, in other terms we're saying uh, that when, when you lose contact with the person you or you or of study then you definitely do not have information on that person and that is what we call a censored observation and then uh, lastly, we look at what we call the survival function. And uh, the survival function, uh, like we described, is the probability that a subject survives longer than time t. So that probability is what we call the survival function. And that, is, uh, that marks our conclusion for this uh, introduction to survival analysis. Uh, for today's particular lecture, uh, there are some references that are in here. In your free time, you can actually go through and uh, be able to read uh, <coughs> some of these references uh, and be able to go through them. Uh, you can be able to get further uh, understanding of, of, of survival analysis. And the, the, the references are as many as, as you can imagine. And they are here, uh, Encyclopedia of Biostatistics, you, if you want to look at link uh, at linear rank tests in survival analysis and so forth and so on. So there are very many references here that uh, you can actually use uh, for uh, uh, tackling more or trying to understand further uh, this particular uh, module. So do we have any questions uh, on that? Uh, do we have any questions? If we do not have any questions, uh, that's